Right then, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, whatever it is, wherever you are. My name is Paul, I'm also called Knack Knack. I have, I believe, a slight cold. Hopefully it's not the COVID-19 lurgy that's doing the round, but either way, I've got the sniffles. On top of that, I do the daily teaser uh, every day. It goes past on my YouTube channel, at MrCuddy2977, and on my blog, Knack Knack's Old Peculiar. I also talk about movies I've watched, I also talk about TV shows I've been watching, and I will try and put various links to those and my tip jar up in the corner there so you can browse at your leisure. It's 21.30. Thank you, Katie. Or you can, you know, donate as well if need be. At any rate, over the past few weeks I've been watching the reconstructed uh, classic Doctor Who serial, The Abominable Snowmen. That stars Patrick Troughton as the second Doctor. I've put this video on a playlist full of my video reviews of earlier episodes, so feel free to browse. But this particular video is my review of the sixth ep and final episode of the story, and I've added a few pointed comments about various other bits and bobs that are relevant to what's been happening. At any rate, let me try and summarise episode 6 of The Abominable Snowmen. Episode 6 picks up from last week's cliffhanger, showing his glowing green lights crawling away out from a cave in the mountains of Tibet. The scene shifts to show us the Doctor, Patrick Troughton, being told by Travers, Jack Watlin, that the cave in the mountains is being used by Abbot Songston to seemingly control the robot Yeti. After all, the Abbot, Charles Morgan, was being followed into it by four of the creatures. It's only at the end of this conversation that the Doctor finds out that Chris Song, Norman Jones, has gone to talk to Abbot Songston, Charles Morgan, said not already, but never mind, and that Chrisong is quite possibly in terrible danger. Something Chrisong only finds out for himself when he confronts Songston and Master Padma Sambavar, Wolf Morris, and ends up being stabbed in the back by no less a person than the abbot himself. With the dirty deed done, the Doctor, Tomney, Jamie and Victoria all burst into the inner sanctum to find Chrisong bleeding to death on the floor. Before he dies, Chrisong tells the Doctor and the, the rest of the monks or his friends should not blame the abbot. Whilst outside, Tomney, David Spencer, tells the monks that the abbot has done whilst under another's influence and what they have to do as a result. The brothers have to flee the monastery, whilst he, the Doctor, and a few others deal with the corrupt master and the control devices for the Yeti hidden behind the Master's throne. No. What did I make of the episode? What did I make of the series? What, if anything, have I learnt or noticed or seen? And what have I made of one or two other bits of news that came across my, my purview, I think the word is. Um, the episode itself, starting with that first question. The episode itself is great fun. It closes off the story well, with a big dramatic confrontation between the Doctor and Padma Sambavar. A confrontation that sees off the great intelligence that's been controlling the sage for many years. It also shows us a sad ending, both for Padma Sambavar and for Chrisong. Bravery from Chrisong and Jamie and Tommy and Victoria waving a lovelorn farewell at the end of the episode to Tommy. I think that happens to Doctor Who girls a lot, to be honest with you. There's always one of them waving a sad goodbye at somebody or getting a, a sad parting from somebody else. Joe Grant speaks to mind here. The amount of people in her last series that feel completely in love with her is just outrageous. At any rate, it shows us all these things, but it shows us also that Travers, Jack Watling, um, has hope, herring off after a real Yeti at the end of the episode. It also shows as a prone robot Yeti, um, one that, from what we learn later, has been taken back to England by Travers, and that presumably is the one we see in the opening of 
the web of fear something i might just have to sit down and review at some point there's a few iffy bits and bobs going on there i think at any rate the last few minutes of the episode show us a prone yeti a prone yeti that's still twitching it is to be perfectly honest with you a perfectly good episode and a perfectly good finish to a great little serial talking of which what did i make of the overall serial the abominable snowman as a collected story and the blu-ray it came on for starters the animation is as good as it ever was yes there are, are some changes made the animated monks for example look more east asian than the white english actors that we know play them in the original live action broadcast the same goes for padma sambava there's changes there he's an aged looking white english action in the original live action broadcast as we can see from the included telesnaps version of the story but in this animated reconstruction he's an animated corpse with glowing green eyes whenever the great intelligence takes over um the real yeti that travis chases at the end of episode six in the animation in the reconstruction it looks like something like a uh, an albino gorilla, a large upright albino gorilla that runs off in fright, but replaces the reused robot Yeti that was used in a live action version. They had him in costume, they were running around. Let's grab one of them, let's not let's spend the money on an extra different costume. So, with that particular point, the live action and cartoon Yeti, there's probably good decisions for that. They changed it because they could. Um, but at any rate, those changes were something I initially had my doubts about, as I said in my review of episode one. But it has to be said that overall, those changes are done sensitively and very unobtrusively. After the first five minutes, after that first episode, for me, I didn't notice it. That was Tommy. That was the Abba. That was Rin Chen. So they, they, they didn't, for me, intrude on the storytelling. Um, talking of the storytelling, again, overall, it is well acted, well made, and well restored, and above all, very well done. Those who've read my written reviews over on Nick Max Old Peculiar will notice that the average rating for all six episodes adds up to three and two thirds stars which is possibly not as the series doing the whole series complete justice but it is a well written watchable piece that is well worth your time and possibly your money as well about my only concern there is on the money front you as with all of these reconstructions you get three different versions of the told story. You get a black and white animation, you get a telly snaps reconstruction, and you get the colour animation, which is the version I tend to watch. My only real concern is that the, the extras on this, much like the extras on some of the reconstruction versions, are... We've got a photo gallery, we've got the scripts, we've got some of Fraser Hines' home movies from the filming, uh, and the uh, Trout in Tibet making of documentary as well. They're well done, and they are interesting to see, but they do seem, as with all of these reconstructions, a little, a little sparse. I know these things are expensive to make, but maybe one or two extras in each of them could have been helpful. Like a quick video guide to Tibetan Buddhism in this one would maybe have been handy or appreciated i don't know what if anything else did i learn or notice let's talk about that abbot you as i will notice that the character is named in or on the case and stuff in the case the character is named as abbot songsten s-o-n-g-s-t-e-n that's how he's listed on the case on the blu-ray case how he's listed in the wikipedia entry and how he's listed in the two sets of imdb entries as well 
and in the original script included with the, the Blu-ray. The reason there's two IMDb entries is one for the original live action version, one for the reanimated version. Now I'm assuming that Wikipedia and IMDb take their cues from the script. But, and this is something I noticed in episode one as well as episode six, the other characters in the actual audio address the abbot as abbot song sen s o n g t s e n not s t t s more in line i think as far as i can see with various different eastern languages i'm assuming that the writers of the story Mervyn Hazeman and Henry Lincoln lifted the name from the ancient Tibetan king Songsen Gampo, S O N G T S E N Gampo, G A M P O. They lifted the name, but for whatever reason, they've spelt it as Song Sten, S T E N, when writing the script, and either couldn't or wouldn't correct it by the time they sent the script off to the BBC. Uh, I'm assuming they had their reasons for that, but they couldn't correct it. And I'm assuming that the only thing they could do was, either at the rehearsals or in discussion with the director, Gerald Brake, uh, the only thing they could do was hold up their hands rather sheepishly and say, um, about the abbot, and then tell whoever what the actual name was. But I don't know for sure. That, to me, seems plausible, but I don't know how to explain the literature, the paperwork, saying he's Song Sten, and the actors calling him Song Sen. What else did I learn or did I notice? I remember reading many years ago that there were two broad schools of Tibetan Buddhism. Um, and I don't know the Tibetan names, because me and foreign languages just usually aren't a good mix but they're broadly known as the red hats and the yellow hats um the dalai lama from the very little i know and from the very little i found on wikipedia the dalai lama is a yellow hat despite usually dressed being dressed as a monk in his usual red robes or red robes with a yellow stripe on him i have no idea which sect the debts and monks were supposed to be uh, but their robes in this colour animation are red and similar to the Dalai Lama's. Their abbot wears red robes but with a yellow overrobe or yellow sash, and you guessed it, a yellow hat, one like a, a sort of extended kapur, an extended skull cap with a mohawk. I, you should be able to find it on Google quite easily enough. But that's what he looks like. He looks like he's wearing a skull cap with a mohawk, and as far as I can tell, those hats are fairly common amongst yellow hat uh, Tibetan Buddhists, and it implies to me that the monks of Detsen are, much like the Dalai Lama, a yellow hat or Gelug Buddhists, assuming I've right and got that correct. If I ever get to meet the man, I can ask the Dalai Lama, but I think that's probably going to be quite some time away but at any rate if you know for sure please feel free to leave me a comment either on the blog or on the youtube channel under this video um i think there's possibly more i could have picked up or could have learned or could have seen or could have whatever but i can tell you that that covers most things the abominable snowman is a great deal of fun it's worth your time it's possibly worth your money as well but as a last thought for you, there are potential issues, I think, with any future animated reconstructions. Back in January, rumours started going around that the re reconstructed reanimations would be cancelled. And back in September of this year, Gary Russell, the executive producer from Big Finish, who is in charge of these animations, confirmed that this particular story was going to be the last for now, as BBC America had pulled its funding for the releases. From the little I could see, he and BBC Studios are trying to find other 
funding partners. There's at least three Patrick Troughton episodes left that could do with reconstructing, assuming they've got the audio sources. And I think there's quite a few William Hartman ones as well. But, for now, The Abominable Snowman is it. And I am deeply disappointed, as I imagine other fans my age, and probably younger fans as well, are also disappointed. I'm aware, as I suspect many of us are, that William Hartnell's second season as the Doctor is due for release, or has been re released. And the stories in that season are complete by the Crusade, and its two missing episodes have been reconstructed with tally snaps, with the publicity photos taken at the time. Granted, BBC America wants to make sure of its bottom line. Granted, it's got a it wants to see a business case for every single one of these things that gets made. But I think its decision and the timing of its decision to withdraw funding is bloody atrocious. I think many of us would have been happy to see a reconstructed crusade, part of that second season. Um, would have been happy to see a reconstructed crusade on the lines of the Reign of Terror or Invasion, where the missing episodes are replaced by animated reconstructions rather than deli snap reconstructions, and they would have rather seen that before another box set. Now, granted, those box sets are fantastic bits of work, especially the extras included with them. The behind the sofas are fantastic. But I think I and others would have preferred to have seen those missing stories first. Like I say, there's about three Patrick Troughton ones. There's a lot of William Hartnell ones. They could have been done first. I think they should have maybe taken priority over the early years box sets. I think, personally, there is more than just fan eagerness or fan curiosity here at stake. Or the money that BBC America could be saving, and probably is saving, that's always an important thing, I think, for many businesses. I think the live action programmes, the live action reconstructions, or the telesnaps reconstructions, which take photos from the set, can tell us a lot about the time those programmes were made, about how writers, producers, the BBC, how they felt about dramas being made at the time, about science fiction made at the time, about the history the stories were trying to tell us about, were trying to educate us about. And I think... I think they can tell us a lot about the times they were made and the people making them. I also think the animated reconstructions can tell us about how the world is now. It can tell us about how the world has changed since the originals were made and when the new versions were made. It can tell us about how the world has changed since then. For me, for anyone in, interested in history, I think that is a valuable thing. And I can only hope that alternative funding is found. I think we need to see history as well as good entertaining stories. <laughs> Now, as a last closing thought, I don't know what I'll be reviewing next, whether it's a film or a TV show. I don't know when I'll be doing it either. It is, after all, as I recall this, it's the 13th of December. It's coming up in the last couple of weeks before Christmas, so I don't know what I'll be doing or watching next. As soon as I do do something, if you're subscribed to my blog, Knickknacks Old Peculiar. If you're watching me on my YouTube channel, and please feel free to subscribe and ding the notification bell and hit the like button if you're watching this on YouTube. Uh, you'll be watching it on my YouTube channel at Mr. Cuddy2977. Whatever I do next and whenever I do it, you'll be the first to hear about it as soon as I do. I will see you the next time I see you. I hope your Christmas goes well if you're not watching the daily teasers and whatever else is that happening. I'll see you later.